Hey guys, Provo1701 here, and today we're going to be reviewing part one of The Myth Makers, which is called The Temple of Secrets. This, of course, is the loose cannon reconstruction that I've been watching. Now, I've read The Myth Makers before. I have read the Target novel. Uh, I believe that's one of the ones Fly Attractor sent me, and I really liked it. Uh, but I do know the novelization is a bit different than the actual TV stories because the novelization is written from Homer's point of view. Uh, so they, they aren't exactly direct translations from TV to novel. But going into some of these stories, especially the ones that are complete reconstructions, I do like having read the novel first uh, because I, it gives me an I, I already know what happens, basically. I already know the story. I know the plot. It makes it easier to follow along when you're watching recons. Um, and I never scratch a Doctor Who story off my haven't seen list until I've actually seen it, some form of it, on TV or a computer screen. Reading a novelization, I don't scratch it off my list. I have to hear the surviving audio and see some kind of visual representation of the story before I scratch it off my list. That's just that's how I do my list. Um, I have to say, the very beginning of this episode was a challenge to get through. You ever have something you start watching and you get very, just a little ways into it and you're like, oh dear, oh dear. I remember thinking that when I first started watching The Dominators, I was like, oh dear, it got better, but oh dear. That's how I was, literally, I was a minute and 26 seconds in. I know because I paused it and had to get up and walk away for about five minutes because, oh dear, first off, the myth, the myth Makers is another one of those stories that doesn't have a lot of telesnaps. It was, I think, the first story made while, while John Wiles was the producer. I think that's his name, John Wiles. And he did not really employ John Cura to do telesnaps. So a lot of his brief era, thankfully brief, uh, as the producer of Doctor Who during Season 3, missing episodes don't have telesnaps re, uh, representing them. We also have that problem with, of course, Dalek's Master Plan and The Massacre. Um, so there's not a lot of existing telesnaps. So a lot of these have been cobbled together. They've created telesnaps or some of the few existing, I'm guessing, production stills get used over and over and over and over and over. You see a lot of the same photographs of characters a lot or a few, what remaining few there are. You see them a lot. There's a lot of picture reuse in this, um, uh, which it, it's not Loose Cannon's fault. That's all they have to work with. And what they have done with it is impressive considering what little there is to work with. The biggest problem at a minute and 26 in, I had figured out quickly was, my God, the incidental music that plays at the beginning. When Hector and Achilles are fighting, the incidental music, and it actually plays further in. About the first two and a half minutes of this story are a chore to get through. Because the incidental music is some of the worst, if not the worst, incidental music I've ever heard in Doctor Who. Modern or classic. It's awful. It doesn't fit what's going on on screen. What I can imagine was originally going on or the reconstruction. It doesn't fit two ancient warriors dueling and battling at all. It feels more like something comedy or parody or Benny Hill-like. Because uh, it's this... Hur, hur. Her. Matter of fact, I'm literally filming from a different angle so I can play it and you can hear it. We're going to listen to a little excerpt from the beginning music, which is so bad it rivals the ballad of Johnny Ringo in it, when it comes to awfulness. Let's see here. <laughs> I want to run. Let me see it. Maybe it was a little further back was the worst part. There. What? The length of the big arm? Her, 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 her. 
I literally was a minute and 26 seconds in. I had to stop and walk away. That's two, that's, that's two, 30, two minutes and 30 seconds of the hardest Doctor Who I've ever had to watch. And it's less the telesnap, although that's a little rough too. And more of that music that doesn't fit what's happening on the screen. And at two and a half minutes in, I was like, God help me, I am in for a chore. I was sitting there thinking, maybe I'm going to have to wait for this one to be animated. I don't know if I'm going to make it through four episodes of this. I don't know. But the animation for Myth Makers isn't likely. We might not get it for five or ten years. I still might have to wait for it to get animated. <laughs> that was my thought going in. Five years, I might have to hold off on that. Because, ooh. Now, it gets better. That is easily the worst part of the episode. And two and a half minutes of the worst of Doctor Who. Um, after that, it gets better. Again, uh, once I adjusted to having to watch a recon, I was in better shape because I was just coming off having watched uh, The Return of Dr. Mysterio and filming that review and jumping straight into episode one of this. Um, so I was having to mentally shift gears. I like Hartnell in this a lot. He's putting in a good performance. You can tell from the audio. audio. He's putting in a really good performance. Um, I love how self-confident he is the whole time. Uh, how he's not taking any crap from anybody. Once again, the doctor feels like the doctor, unlike certain blonde-haired doctors we've had recently, let us say. This doctor, the first doctor, the original you might say, feels very confident. He never feels like he's lost control of the situation. Even when he's been taunted and he's surrounded by guards and being led away to the camp, he never feels out of control of the situation. And he remains confident in that I'm the first doctor, I'm the smartest person in the room, and y'all all need to listen to me, or else that the first doctor does so well. Hartnell nails that. Um, <clears throat> Vicky and Steven don't get a lot to do here. Vicky's mostly stuck in the TARDIS. Apparently her ankle's still bothering her, I'm guessing from Galaxy 4, I forget. Um, Steven gets a little bit at the end with him and the doctor pretending not to know each other. I like the performances going on. We don't get much of Hector before he gets killed. Achilles is good, especially just how determined he is to think the Doctor is Zeus. I love that. But he doesn't seem feverent about it. Like, he's not, like, obsessed with it, but he firmly believes. You know, he's more in awe of it because he firmly believes in his mind, this is Zeus. So he's just more in that kind of state of awe. I really like the guy playing Odysseus in this. He, he has a very theatrical performance, very much. I'm, I, that guy has to have acted on, on stage. He has to have been on stage at some point. He has this very theatrical way he acts. The way, even in the pictures, the kind of body language it looks like he's doing. And then his performance, he has this kind of booming voice, this kind of loud, shouty, projecting voice. He projects when he talks uh, like you're projecting at a theater. And I really liked that. That, of course, appealed to my theatrical background. So I really enjoyed him. Uh, the guy playing Ag Agamemnon seemed fine, and the guy playing his brother seemed fine. I enjoyed their little talk uh, about how uh, his brother's kind of like, you know what, I just want to leave. I don't care about Helen, I just want to go. And I'm like, this is a guy who gets it. <laughs> I don't want to deal with these women, <laughs> I just want to go. This guy gets it, <laughs> I like him. And he's like, come on, I want to, Agamemnon, I want to get out of here. I'm not getting any younger. And then Agamemnon's like, you're not going to get any older either. You keep talking to me like that. I enjoyed that because it felt like sibling banter, like the way a brothers would talk. I enjoyed that. I, that really came across well. And it amused me. I found it, uh, that whole conversation, a bit amusing too. And again, I like how his brother was just like, it, 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 screw Helen, I just want to get out of here. You should have challenged Paris. I tried. He wouldn't accept We'll let you challenge Hector. Well, that would be suicide. I'll issue it in the morning. <laughs> I enjoyed that whole part. And that's right when Achilles runs in. Oh, I've killed Hector. You what? Not a good plan, really. <laughs> it has a bit of a bit of a humor in it here. It's interesting that um, even in part one, we haven't really met any of the uh, Trojans yet. I mean, we met Hector briefly. Uh, but a lot of the key players in this story, like, King Pram and, of course, uh, his daughter and Paris and all that. We haven't met them yet, so we're a quarter way through the story, and there's still a lot of key players in the story we haven't been introduced to yet. That's interesting. And then the cliffhanger of the TARDIS being missing is a pretty cool cliffhanger, just seeing the shield laying on the ground where it had been propped up by the TARDIS, because obviously the Trojans took it. 
Uh, that's still a neat little cliffhanger. Uh, part one was, was fine. Once it got moving, it was fine. Uh, again, a lot of the pictures get reused. I could see Die Hard fans, especially classic Die Hard fans, you know, we can get through them pretty well. I could see like a casual person really struggling. I mean, I'm sure a casual viewer might struggle with recons anyway, but especially one of these where it's so limited to the existing shots, uh, I think it would be hard for them to get through. I'm not gonna lie, uh, I'm a big fan of Classic Who, and I found those two first two and a half minutes really hard to get through. <laughs> Okay. You hear how long that goes on and oh, oh. Find out whoever did the music for that and never let them do music again. That is awful. Like I said, I have to choose. Do I listen to that or do I listen to the ballad of Johnny Ringo? Mm. Or do I just stab something into my ears? Uh. So, that's my thoughts on Temple of Secrets, episode one of The Myth Makers. I still prefer the novelization thus far. We'll see when I get to part two, which might be a minute. So, I want to know what you think of episode one of The Myth Makers and that wonderful incidental music. So, comment down below and let me know. Other things to do, don't forget to click the like button and the subscribe button. That helps me out. And I am trying to reach 1,000 subscribers in 2023. We're well on our way to that. Uh, I also have started another channel called Geek Speak Euphoria, where I talk about other things like superhero movies, video games. I did beat Breath of the Wild recently. I'll be, I ranked the Zelda games recently, <clears throat> ranked all the Superman movies recently. So if you want to hear me talk about some non-sci-fi related stuff, check that out. Again, that's called Geek Speak Euphoria. I also have a Patreon if you would like to contribute to what I do. That does help me keep the bills paid, especially this year. Um... So the link to that is down in the description below. I want to give a shout out to some of my top tier patrons, Stephen Crane, Colin Coney, and Finn Perkins. I appreciate their support, as I do the support of all of my patrons. And I also appreciate one of my new patrons, Zach, who joined recently. I really appreciate that as well. I also have a P.O. Box. If there's anything you would like to send me to look at and review, sci-fi related or otherwise, just something you think I might be interested in. I also have a link to my Amazon wish list down there as well, if you want to check that out. I update that regularly. Most importantly, though, thank you for watching.